time. So, but there is a tiny bit, mostly this. Um, so, a little bit about me. I've done a bunch of stuff. Um, very much a generalist. Work on um, cloud for a company that's doing blockchain powered microgrids. So if you're in the Portland area and you do like any of those things, let me know because um, we're ramping up. Um, worked at Autodesk for a while and part of, as part of that worked on a project for SOC 2 compliance on the Docker-based service, which is a unique thing um, that we were able to achieve at the time. Um, so uh, now a lot of this talk comes from what I learned there and um, kind of inspired by what I saw when I was working on that project. So just a little bit of new information for those who've been there. My primary responsibility in that project was around tooling for the environment, um, evaluating just about everyone who was doing this. So I have opinions on a ton of people in this space. Um, so uh, ask me about that at some point later. So I will say this though, and just to reiterate for those uh, um, who've already heard it, um, if uh, like a high level like compliance certification like actual stamp of approval for like SOC 2 or something else is a key motivator for you um, this stuff is more informative you'll probably want to look at a commercial tool though they just do a lot more things for you and they do a better job than some of the stuff that's open source but um, that being said if your budget zero uh, which a lot of us have that or um, if you're just curious what you can do to get better without having to approach your manager for money um, this is uh, a good talk for you so we're going to talk a little bit about runtime monitoring um, there is some demo so the last session we had a little bit of a snag we managed to get through it this hopefully will, will go a little better um, I've verified the CPU is not pegged on this instance uh, so Hopefully that will make a big difference. Um, uh, but this will be a little more um, demo oriented and then hopefully you can get some good stuff out. So I do want to say um, this talk is more about Docker containers than it is about any other container runtime you have or may have. Though what I'm going to show you today, um, particularly with a, with a couple of open source tools, will work for even if you're not using containers. Um, so that's some good news for this talk. So if you really love Rocket, you should be able to use most of this stuff. Um, and also, I'm not going to pay attention to your orchestration platform of choice. Um, this is really not about that. Uh, this is really about what we can do for runtime monitoring for container environments. All right. We do want to talk a little bit about what makes a container-based environment different. So there's a few aspects when you're running containers or in production or at scale that's different than what you may have been used to with traditional virtual machines that make the tools that we've been using to monitor machines not work as well in a container-based environment and why we need some things that can help close those gaps. So one of those things is just pure density, right? Before, if you run a virtual machine, you probably, if you're doing it right, you really only have one process that it's responsible for, right? There may be forks and things that it does, but it only runs Nginx or it only runs Rails. Um, you're not running Rails and your database and, you know, Node and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, on the same box in traditional architectures, right? or at least you shouldn't. Um, containers, you know, we kind of throw all that because it's so easy to distribute, move around, we spin up Kubernetes and we say, hey, we want 40 API edge endpoints. Um, and here's the container, put them wherever you want. And Kubernetes does just that. And we don't know where they live. We could have all 40 on one node. If it's capable of handling that traffic, we could have it distributed across our entire organization and our cluster. We don't know. And it also is multi-tenant shared with all the other things, services that are running that environment. So that is something that makes traditional monitoring a little bit trickier because you, we can get perspective of, okay, yeah, the overall load is manageable, but is any particular container behaving badly is a little harder to tell. Um, or, or at least, be, and also harder to identify like with what the container is, it's bad. So another thing that's a little different is just the mobility, right? So in traditional architectures, 
you have a machine that runs one thing, you don't really move it off that one thing. If you need something like it, you spin up a new machine and do it. Um, and you're, you're managing this lower level infrastructure. And containers, you know, Kubernetes could choose to move your container whenever, right? Or, you know, in your swarm cluster, right? You could, uh, you could just kill it and spin it up somewhere else or have it move, right? So things move around. You can't rely on them always being in the same place. Um, so if you're trying to, you know, dial in your, you know, Sensu checks to work on a particular host because it runs this container. You can't really be confident it's going to do that. So this all comes down to you know how you do monitoring, logging become is a little bit different, right? We have containers that are spinning off their own logs, which are very different than the host logs, which we now need to manage. Um, and but we still need to capture that information. And so, and the monitoring tools we've been using may struggle to identify unique containers and, and problem spaces in containers. So, one way you could get around this is you could put you know, Sensu client inside your container and hook it up to your infrastructure and do it that way. But I think that would be a bad idea because one, your container is now really no longer single purpose and you might bake a lot of things in that you don't really need. And two, um, it's just a lot of extra bits and headache for things that, um, that there are other tools that can help us manage. So that's what we want to look at today is what are some of the capabilities, open source stuff that we can use to get some perspective on our running environments for containers. So I do want to mention a bit about Docker logging. Um, so if you're familiar, if you use Docker a lot, you may run into this or you may just inherit whatever your orchestration platform does. I want to talk a little bit about what it's doing at the uh, Docker engine itself so that you can get some perspective. Though if you're running Kubernetes, it kind of handles most of this for you. You may want to override it if you want to take a container and say, hey, I want to it to go to you know syslog directly without going through you know some orchestration path. So Docker provides uh, an option called log driver and a collection of uh, built-in uh, output drivers for logs coming out. So, you know, basically everything that comes out, uh, you know, through this, you know, whatever your logging infrastructure is, you know, that's standard out, you can feed through here, you can send it on to Elasticsearch, you can send it on to whatever your logging backend is. You can either specify this individually for a container on the command line, or you know, overwrite it through some mechanism in your orchestration, or you can set it system wide on a host uh, by specifying a log driver in the Etsy Docker daemon file. So here's some of the built-in ones. You know, some popular ones there. You get CloudWatch, Splunk, FluentD for your cloud native folks, uh, Syslog for the classic. Um, so there's a few things, and this is obviously something you can you know, write your own if you really wanted to. Um, be compatible with this, but you know, it's kind of some default things. So this is how you could, you know, kind of override your existing container, you know, orchestration layers behavior if you wanted to use one of these instead, um, and and do it for a particular service that was different than kind of your global default. One thing though, if you specify one of these log drivers, other than uh, the JSON file driver or journal D, and then um, if you do Docker logs, you will not see anything. It will only go to that output driver. If you use JSON file or journal D, Docker logs will still work if you're on the host and you wanna see what the logs for the container are. <coughs> There's also a log driver called none, which just suppresses all logging. Um, which, depending on your application, so if, you're, if you have like a Rails app that has Graylog directly configured as part of its thing and it's sending things out application logs out and you don't want any of the standard out stuff to be caught, you can specify none. And that could be a security constraint in your environment, right? To suppress log messages and do logging out of your application directly. So it's something to consider that is a special kind of log driver that they provide. All right, so the main thing I want to focus on is two applications, two products from the same company, and that is Sysdig. Anyone ever heard of or used Sysdig? All right. 
got a few people who are probably going to tell me I'm all wrong about this stuff. Cyst egg is magic. It is amazing what it can do. Um, it can get metrics on just about anything. And this is in a situation where this isn't particular to containers. You can use it in your environment to get metrics on the host level uh, for, and we'll, and we'll go through example on literally anything that happens in the kernel, it can do. Um, so it's really kind of the Swiss army knife of monitoring tools. It uses a dynamically loaded kernel module, a probe, to instrument all of the syscalls that are happening in the kernel and then tell you about them in a huge blast of data. So that's something to be aware of when you're working with Sysdig is it generates a lot of information. Now they've got tools to help you pare that down to something that's meaningful and workful, but um, it is a ton of stuff by default. So it is the proverbial fire hose if you want to drink out of it. Um, they also, from uh, whenever I've talked about Cystic before, the first hand that comes up is always, okay, what does it do to my performance? It's a non-zero impact, um, but uh, they do have some uh, guarantees in it to uh, throttle its capabilities. And I don't remember, there's uh, limits you can set to where it won't consume more than like five or 10 percent or whatever, yeah, you can tailor it to what your environment is, and basically it just starts throwing out log messages when it hits those limits. So this is somewhat of a cost. It's because of the amount of information it can collect, um, but just be aware, uh, you can tailor that, and they've done a fairly good job of making it not destroy anything. So Sysdig uses what they call chisels as filters on data that it's collecting. So they're written in Lua, which is a language I've never seen used outside of this, but uh, it's kind of an expression language for the filters that they're using, and it really allows you to get down deep into to what it is and kind of focus in on the data points you need. They also provide a tool you can use locally called CSysdig, which is kind of an interactive, uh, curses interface into what's happening on an environment running Sysdig. We're going to play around with that in a little bit. But the important thing for this talk is it's container aware. It can know or it will log information in a container perspective. So you can tell it, so it can tell you, okay, you know, here are the containers you have running, their names, and here's the resources they're using and their I.O. and blah, 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 blah. Where other tools might just be able to say generally here's what's happening in the system. It can break it down at a container level in a very convenient and, and readable way. So you can really get a good container perspective on your world. All right, we're going to try to look at some Sysdig stuff. Um, I don't have a ton of demos, but I've got some, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, and um, I've already logged into my Sysdig system, so we have. Uh, uh, we're just going to type to give you a, a perspective on how much data this thing's doing. Now, this is a system that's basically just running Sysdig and like one Nginx container. Nice. Oh. <laughs> We're gonna do a lot of stuff with Sysdig, so I'm just gonna do that. You should never just sudo to, to root though, just. Okay, here it goes. Who saw something? Yeah. It is a ton of stuff happening, and there's not really that much happening on the system. It captures everything. Um, so you see some clock time things in there. Um, so there's some, um, you know, s some reads and writes. There's some. Yeah. So this is what uh, the people who, you know, at Sysdig kind of describe it as like. S trace plus LSOF plus um, TCP dump on steroids. Uh, and it really kind of is. It does, like I said, it is the Swiss Army knife of monitoring, monitoring tools. It does pretty much everything because um, it's instrumenting system calls. So anything that happens in the kernel, it knows about. So, by the way, you, you can install Sysdig through a container. You know, they've got a container-based install and stuff. Um, my recommendation, though, is if you are looking at Sysdig and want to 
deploy this in your environment, install the package directly and run it as a service. Don't run it inside the container because it have to run as privileged and, and it just doesn't feel very natural to run as this kind of like side container because really you're wanting to get what's happening underneath the container layer. Um, it does have to compile, like when you download it, it's going to also make sure you have the development headers because it's got to compile with probe and it's got to do all this, you know, the module loading for the kernel. So, you know, compiling and then dynamically loading a kernel module f on the host from a container just is wrong. I don't know why they went down that route and even provided that as an option for install. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're doing this. Uh, you're going to want this on everywhere. Um, when you start rolling out. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff. They also provide a set of built-in chisels to help you kind of drill down and get started on what's there. So you see things that it can do. Um, so there's some performance stuff, right? So it can help you identify what your slowest system calls or I.O. stuff. And again, it can give you container perspective on this information and not simply just what's happening generally. Um, they can do, you know, it can completely replace top if you want it to. Um, it can give you list information about the containers it's running. Um, there's a ton of things it can do. You can kind of analyze what's happening on the system. So let's just go ahead and take a look at um, running a chisel. So I'm going to use this to kind of do replace Docker PS, right? So here's the running containers and give me the information about what container it is, the image, the name, and the ID of the container. And so just super simple chisel. To give you a perspective on the containers, show you how that works. PC is really like give me container picture. And we'll look at... We'll look at the top syscalls out of containers. So you notice something odd, right? So we've got the uh, container running. Amazing Pasture, we saw that in the list. That's our Nginx container. It's also giving us host, which is really, you know, the namespaced processes that are not running inside of like a Docker container, right? That's how you interpret those. So these are all the system calls going out, and it's kind of a top style perspective on, on all the things that are happening. Uh, give another example. Um, you can also, if you're not curious, like, how does this work? We saw all those chisels, and we want to know what this. Um, they thought of that too. So this is a uh, chisel to help trace low network I.O. And so the minus I is basically give me details in this. So here's the parameters that you could use um, uh, to, to run this. So if we were to do um, um, you know, in 500 milliseconds, you know, I don't have any a lot of traffic going over, but there's... Um, you know, this is how you say, like, I'm getting really slow performance on this node. What's going on, right? You can kind of drill down into this and say, okay, I'm getting a ton of latency between these two things. There's a ton of stuff that it can do. So CSYSDIG is a tool that they put on here. Gives you a curses interface to everything going on. So this is where you can kind of, I'm actually going to need to shrink this window, I think. So you can kind of see, this may make it a little hard to read. My apologies. You can kind of see the whole thing. Yeah, it is. But you can see it's kind of got a top style interface. Showing default, basically showing you what top would. But from here, you can kind of drill down into it. So let's go ahead and hit um, some views. 
right? So here are all the built-in views it can give on on stuff. So it can tell containers, errors in containers, file I/O. You know, this has got Marathon, Mesos. Um, I think it's got some Kubernetes stuff in there. Yeah, all the K8 stuff, the pods, replica sets, deployments. So it can give you a perspective on what those things, specific things, are happening on the system that you can work with. So this is, you can use CSYSTIC to help identify, you know, go through all the data it's producing, drill down to, okay, what it is I'm really interested in to do some real-time analysis, and also help inform you, okay, now that I know this is the data I like to see for this problem, I can write a chisel, load that in, and have that chisel be fill, f sending information out. And so I can, and then, it, then feed that into like Elasticsearch or wherever you want to do your monitoring from. All right. So let's just kind of show you a little bit on um, how you might be able to integrate this with the logging uh, framework. By default, the open source version of Sysdig is kind of meant to be run locally. But they give you a mechanism you could use if you wanted to connect it with your own infrastructure and still use the open source version. So we're going to do so C is a size. We're going to set this to 500. So we're going to let Sysdig write trace files out. We're going to set up a rotation on it, and then minus W is the switch you need. Or Log sys All right, so this is going to set up a daemon process that's going to run and continually output the file, assuming it's... What did I do wrong? I don't know what I did wrong there. Did you mean to specify 500? That's just the maximum size for rotation. Let me go back to one that I did before. Oh, I forgot the dev null, blah, blah, blah. All right, I'll do that one. So it was working. Capture the output. So yeah, we had our demo file. Now these are trace files. They are not text files. So that's something to note. The Sysdig can read them uh, back to you if you need them. So let's um, just kind of show you that. So if you try to come here and go, what did it put out? Come on. This is why demos are so awesome. All right, so super useful. But if you do sysdig minus r to read a trace file, you can give it the file you want to read. So this is what it captured during that time. So if we had some chisels running in that line, we could have captured just the information that we need. I just, you know, for the sake of demo, put in that. Still a ton of information for just a few seconds of execution, uh, but it captures a lot of stuff. All right. So let's talk about Falco. Falco is created by the Sysdig people. It is an open source component. This is a security focused library on top of Sysdig. So what Falco does is it takes the, all the information that's coming out of the Sysdig probe and looks for violations of security rules. So it's really about security monitoring. So they've described this, or it has been described as kind of like a lightweight IDS 
um, that's kind of run locally on the box. So it does use the probe. So when you install Falco, if, you do, if it doesn't have a SysGig probe on the box, it's going to download the necessary components. It's going to build that kernel probe, install it, and then set up Falco. Again, this is one of those things where they distribute it as a container that you can install as. My recommendation if you're going to use Falco is install it as a service and run it locally as a service. It's really meant to be something that is across the entire host, not something that runs as a container. It would have to run as a privileged container to install it or to do its in order to do the kernel module. So just install it and run it as a service. Now, one note about it, it is alert only. So a lot of the commercial tools, Twistlock, Aqua, New Vector, Stack Rocks, et cetera, all these ones that are coming out now, they uh, work with the container engines and are actually able to enforce policy and block actions. Right? So you can set a policy rule and say, um, um, I don't want anyone to be able to write to this particular file or open its network port or change users, right? And not only will it tell you, oh no, someone tried to do this, but you can actually lock, prevent the action from happening. You can intercept the syscall and prevent the container from executing it. So it's a really cool thing. And again, those are on the commercial tools, so they're all pricey. Um, but if your compliance or that need is something you really need, that's probably a better solution for you than Falco is. But if, if I just know that it's happened is good enough to start with, Falco could be a really powerful tool for you. So it is detect only. Um, so it does kind of rely on humans to take actions on things. But we're going to take a look a little bit about how Falco works. So again, my same box here. So when Falco is set up, I have Falco running as a service. It's running as a daemon there. Um, and it is reading everything out of the SysDig probe and evaluating against its rules files. Those rules live by default. Uh, here, an Etsy Falco rule. So it's a YAML file that kind of defines everything that uh, Falco is watching for. And there's a few different types. Um, so, you know, macros are that kind of reusable components for rules. Um, so it can look for, you know, so here's some items that, it's, that has listed, like so in core binaries. So this is kind of, the Falco rules file is really meant, general one that they provide, is really meant to be kind of a resource file. So you may not be really editing this too much, um, but it's a good kind of information like all the things that are powerful, or all the things you can, you can do in here. So like here's, a, here's one for like a Koala scan there, right? So it's looking for, is Koala running it? So that's a re kind of reusable name component for a rule. You would put your rules in. Now you can specify different rule sets to do, but here's an example of a custom rule. So the rule is that anytime curl is run inside of a container. Oh, I have a typo in there. Copy and paste error. Um, that I want to know about it. You know, I, you know, I've set a rule in my environment that we should never run curl inside of a container. If someone has, I suspect that container's been compromised and is trying to download malware. So we've got, um, you know, kind of a, a, a matcher here. You know, set the event type is an execution. Directory is anywhere and, you know, um, Basically, the proc name, we're looking for a process named curl running anywhere inside the container. So, 
So let's do this. So we can take a look at um, just to show you. So I've set Falco up to output via syslog. Oh, it's filled up the directory. No, you filled up, you filled up your disk with your uh, Yep. Output. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Oh, no. Oh, it's not running. Um, Come on. Demos are so much fun. Yeah. All right. That's a little better. Now we should be able to work. All right. No, even to kill that process and didn't. <laughs> so. so, just kind of show you where it ends there. Um, we got a fault from a previous attempt. We're going to go ahead and restart Falco and clear this out. So you can prove I didn't plant a line in the log file. Okay. Falco's up and running. It's enforcing our rules. You do have to restart Falco anytime you create a new rule, by the way. Uh, so we're going to run a container. Docker. Run. And then I called this... Um, So I'm a malicious person. I've gotten control of this container. Now I'm going to download my malware, malware from Google, which I've also compromised to feed me malware. All right, so you notice it allowed it. It worked, right? So if, if this were a compromised container, um, it would have downloaded the malware and proceeded on. But there's nothing Falco could do about that problem. But... It was able to detect it. So you notice it told me two things. It's got a default rule for you shouldn't spawn a shell inside a container. So it caught me on that. All right. And then it also our custom rule not to allow, not to or detect if curl was run inside a container was caught. So it told me the user that did it, and that's the user inside the container, and the name of the container, which could matter if you actually named your containers, or at least have you tracked it down and the ID of the run, and uh, where it tried to go, the command line, um, which is cut off by a window size. But Yeah, so there, that's the command line it tried to do. So I could take, I'm outputting the syslog, right? So I could take that, I could be feeding that into Elasticsearch, I can have an alert looking for Falco alert saying, some, Falco report something with my rule sets, tell me about it because it's stuff that should not be happening. Right? And that could then trigger some action so someone can go, oh no, someone just tried to download malware from a container on one of our hosts, maybe someone should do something about that. There's a whole lot of things that it can do out of the box. Just to kind of show you, they have a, a neat utility for testing your rules or testing you know, the, their default rule set. This is just kind of fun to see it work. Uh, Falco event generator. Oh, 
Sysdig Falco event generator. All right, so now it's got a container that's going to go through and do a bunch of really nasty things. doing things so it's showing you here's some you know unexpected set UID that's that it's tracking so this is all really based on kind of the default rule set out of the box so even just installing in your environment setting up the service having it feed logs into your system can start giving you some pretty interesting information about what can be happening inside your containers and you know it's, it's giving you that container perspective right I know exactly what container did it and what they tried to do So, um, um, just so I don't leave this one running. So that's really all I had for, for this part today. I was hoping to have a couple other things, but they weren't quite working before this, unfortunately. Um, but it's some good place to start. Um, one thing I will say about Sysdig, um, since we're talking about doing things on the cheap. So I showed you a couple of ways you can use the Sysdig agent. You can use you know, Sysdig itself and Falco locally, and you can maybe you know, have your own kind of log output that gets fed into your logging system, and that would work. You can use all their open source stuff. Sysdig also provides a service called Sysdig Cloud, uh, which is a service back component, and they, for, they distribute a special version of Sysdig and Falco that has automatic integrations into that, and that's really the product they're selling. Under the covers, what it, its actual capabilities aren't any different. It's the only thing that's added is they've added automatically the data pipes, into, and they're hosting the infrastructure for managing the data. It's actually super reasonably priced. And that's the only reason why I mention it. Um, since we're talking about on the cheap, for what, what Sysdig does, that's pretty cheap. Um, $20 per host per month. It'll instrument and tell you about 15 containers per host and a bunch of stuff. And then they've got data integrations in Slack or PagerDuty or whatever you have. So. Just worth mentioning, this might be one of the situations where, yes, the open source stuff gets you somewhere, but um, uh, it's worthwhile trying these out as well. They're, this is one of those rare situations where a startup doesn't gouge you simply because you're the first. All right, again, GitHub link. Uh, these slides, and really there's not ton of stuff to them, um, are not yet posted. I will get them in GitHub. I guess you got to follow me in order to get to know that they're there. Uh, that's my clever hook to get more followers on GitHub, I guess. All right, and that's it. Any questions? A quick one, Chris. Yep. Um, <clears throat> you spoke a little bit about the break, at the break about monitoring uh, somebody else's uh, environment. Mm -hmm. is, it, is, it, is there any sort of um, uh, practice of, in, uh, of distributing uh, Sysdig or another monitoring tool and dropping that into a um, into a container that if you're dealing with decentralized systems you, you, you're building a, a container for somebody else to run but you would like to then monitor that, that container. Sysdig doesn't really, these tools don't really run inside a container. Is there any tools like that I can run? Um, so you're wanting to get some perspective on what's happening on someone else running your container? Yes. You'd probably have to put some kind of logging out, some kind of output from your application, and keep it, you know, within your application. It's the way I would do it, not rather than relying on a tool. You could, but yeah, I don't know. Those maybe become unpredictable to manage all the data it's producing if you're using some kind of like monitoring tool. I'm particularly interested in the alerts. Yeah. Um, so you want to know if someone's running your container and something happens in their environment. Yes. 
it's a compromise. That's a good question. I don't know. Okay, thanks. Yeah, other than putting something inside the application. Okay, just something um, inside the application that sounds like the right way to go. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's just mostly because, I don't know, I, I, I dislike building extra tools inside a container because now the container is doing more than one thing and it's a little more complex than it needs to be. Now you have like two different kinds of configuration for the same thing. You may be able to do something like a sidecar container, right? So you, your application container is its thing. Um, you have like a log driver that's spitting the information out to that that might say hey, you know, weird things are going on here. Or you have a sidecar container that's running along with it that's instrumenting what's happening. Um, so maybe they're like paired in a pod or something um, that can tell you, hey, this is hap you know, something's gone wrong here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is there uh, any kind of open source tool for uh, basically enforcing, preventing a command from being executed that's detected, like by Falco, for example, like like the curl uh, command that you ran? Is there an open source tool for managing uh, blocking of that type of activity? I don't know of an open source one. Um, doesn't mean there won't be at some point, but a lot of the people who are doing that are trying to start a business. <laughs> so they're kind of keeping that feature for themselves. You could use something like Falco and have a process monitoring the event stream. And if it sees something bad happen, kill the container. And so you could do it yourself with just Falco um, or, you know, move that container somewhere else or isolate it or stop it, just suspend execution so you can do forensics. So do the, do the commercial tools I don't know if any of the commercial tools use Falco okay. um, specifically, mostly because I'm not aware that they do. The ones that I've used, have, they have their own agent, which their own, just their own secret sauce for how it does it. Usually they're, what they do is they'll uh, set up an intercepting socket for Docker when working with Docker containers, and they'll watch all the traffic coming over that socket and then choose based on applied policy whether or not to allow something to go through. Thank you. All right, anything else? All right, thank you everyone for sticking with me.